Hey guys, Alex and Dad from 7th Hour Films back again with Doctor Who. Did you miss us last week? Uh, we were off last week. I hope you enjoyed the Bad Batch uh, reaction that went out on Monday. Most likely you didn't watch it, and that's okay. For the three people that probably did, I hope they enjoyed that at least. Um, but anyway, yeah, we took a break, took a vacation. It was a heck of a time to do that as we stopped right in the middle of a two-parter. Last time around was Aliens of London. What was that one about? Well, again, two weeks, and you know my memory. Uh, I do remember there was a spacecraft that crashed in London, but it turned out to be some kind of big diversion or something because the aliens were already here, and they were very large, not worm-like creatures, but very yeah. bloated creatures that were trying to fit into the human being-type skin. Anyway, they... Because they were very gaseous. A lot of really crude humor. They farted a lot. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the Doctor and Rose were in the process of trying to figure out who was who. And then the, the cliffhanger was they were all going to die. Yeah. So um, <laughs> there's currently one of the Slivin, uh attacking Jackie. There's one attacking Rose and uh, Harriet, uh, Harriet Jones. That was her name. Yes. I should remember this. Harriet Jones. The MP. MP for Flydale North. She said it enough. I ought to remember it by now. <laughs> um, and then there are the two Slitheen that are attacking the Doctor, Unit, and every other alien and military expert that's all gathered into one room. So, yeah, that's pretty much where we left off. Um, and, and overall, a good episode. Uh, a, little, a little stretch for time, but it was... It is their first two-parter of the of the series, so we give a little credit, but that's pretty much where we are. You anything else? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we had a wonderful vacation in the Pacific Northwest. Got to go out to the coast and literally stand next to the Pacific Ocean and just watch and have fun. Very uh, cool day. It was only about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, um, whereas here in Oklahoma it was in the upper 80s and low 90s. Uh, we got to see beautiful waterfall uh, there, uh, just east of uh, Portland, Oregon, and did some other stuff. And then, uh, of course, on the day we were to return home was the worldwide internet outage. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, our flights f from Portland to Denver and then Denver to Oklahoma City were only delayed and not canceled, so we did make it back home uh, essentially only about four hours late. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little after midnight that we finally <laughs> made it back. Uh, on top of the uh, surprising, mainly surprising for me, revelation that I hate flying. <laughs> now, when I say I hate flying, I don't just mean... Physically hates it. Is, I, I don't just mean, like, well, I'm uncomfortable and stuff like that. Like, no, I got so sick that first day of flying to Portland. It was shocking. How yeah. quick and sudden it was! Like as soon as, and we've we've parsed out. It seems to be altitude sickness. But when the plane starts to take off, I go from sitting there. I was completely fine to like you would think I was about to die. Like I was sweating. It was terrible. I was holding in what little lunch I had eaten. What little uh, bit <laughs> of. You know, normal clothing. He was wearing his t-shirt and jeans and everything. Within just a couple of minutes, he was soaking wet, yeah, just from it, the from the nervous per perspiration. It was ridiculous, and um, and yeah. Now, luckily, on the return flights, we had uh, the miracle drug. This is not an ad. This is not a sponsorship. Although, I would happily take a sponsorship. I will. I will show this drug, uh, Bonine. If you ever have these problems, try it, because it somehow worked on me. Again, hashtag not an ad. I'm not going to remember to put that on screen, but just imagine that it's there. So, anywho, uh, so if you're out there and you're a part of the American government, specifically the ones that uh, deal with infrastructure and specifically trains. Let's get these trains working a bit better. Let's try to get some of those bullet trains that the Japanese have. That seems to be a really good idea. And if you could just put that around America and, and then just build a road across the oceans so that I can go to other countries without being on a plane, 
will be solid. <laughs> if you could do that in five years, that'd be really great. So, anywho, I guess that's it. That's pretty much it. So why don't we just go ahead and jump right into this episode of Doctor Who, World War Three. Deadly to humans, maybe. <laughs> Good job. Oh, good. It works remotely, too. Hit him with a frying pan. Oh, even better. This will look great on Twitter. Take a minute. He did it! That man there! I think you'll find the Prime Minister is an alien in disguise. That's never gonna work, is it? No. <laughs> Fair enough. If I was you, if I was gonna uh, execute someone by backing him against the wall, between you and me, little word of advice, don't stand him against the lid. Goodbye. Your guns aren't fast enough. to be naked. Rejoice in it. Your body is magnificent. Alright, now it's getting weird. <laughs> As if it weren't already. I like that they can now use CG to make them move a little faster than monsters in classic. Who exactly are the Slithy? They're aliens. Yes, I got that, thanks. Who are you, if not human? Who's not human? He's not human. He's not human. Can I have a bit of hush? Sorry. <laughs> so, what's the plan? Well, he's got a northern accent. <laughs> Those planets have a north. <laughs> <laughs> then something's brought the Slithy race here. What is it? The Slithy race. Slithy is not our species. Slithine is our surname. Jocrasa Felfot Passive de Slithine at your service. So your family. A family business. <laughs> Installed in 1991. Three inches of steel lining every single wall. They'll never get in. And how do we get out? Ah. <laughs> and this is most unusual. I'm told that is Sylvia Delane, chairman of the North Sea Boating Club. Quite what connects all these people, we have no idea. Do you not notice that they're all of a certain size? Meh. Now, if you'd like to head down to the end of the corridor, it's first on the left. Thank you. So these are somewhat like the Santarans from the original eh, episode. That doctor bloke. Everywhere he goes, death and destruction, and he's got Rose in the middle of it. Has he got a great big green thing inside him then? I wouldn't put it past him. Hey, you're not paying attention. He's too skinny for that. I don't like their little horn tails. What was his name? Who? This one, the uh, secretary or whatever he was called. I don't know. I talked to him. I bought him a cup of coffee. I never asked his name. Sorry. Wish I had a compression field. I could fit a size smaller. Excuse me, people are dead. This is not the time for making jokes. Sorry. You get used to this stuff when you're friends with him. <laughs> well, that's a strange. Hasn't they got like defense codes and things? Can we just launch a nuclear bomb at them? You're a very violent young woman. Are you serious? <laughs> we, the codes have been taken out of the government's hands and given to the UN. Is it important? Everything's important. If we only knew what the Slovene wanted. Listen to me, I'm saying Slovene as if it's normal. Mm. What do they want now? All the secret information known to mankind. See, they've known about aliens for years. They just kept us in the dark. Mickey, you were born in the dark. <laughs> Thank you. Again. Just you know, it's an interesting thing, then, like, five years, they'll just have a smartphone and, and he could just do this himself. Will she always be safe? Can you promise me that? Oh, what's the answer? Hmm. We're in. 
Maybe later we'll tell you about Adric. Nickelodeon slime. Hannibal. Hannibal crossed the Alps by dissolving boulders with vinegar. Taught history for 17 years and never heard that. Hmm. That's the last piece of luck anyone on this rock will ever have. Oh no, now they're going to be serious. We reduce the earth to molten slag, then sell it. Piece by piece. Radioactive chunks capable of powering every cut price starliner and budget cargo ship. There's a recession out there, Doctor. People are buying cheap. This rock becomes raw fuel. At the cost of five billion lives. <laughs> Bargain. Hmm. I give you a choice. Leave this planet or I'll stop. They're real estate agents and miners. It's interesting how she managed to get through that without. Flatulence. Me. Oh, oh, look at that! The telephone is actually red. <laughs> How long till they phone? Counting down. All right, Skittles are imminent. I'm not saying I trust Me. you, but there must. How are you going to pick up the phone with those claws? Me. Use the buffalo pass very, the very gently. Make it easy. <coughs> the world is in your hands. This. Fire. They are releasing the codes. Bring down you. So many of them. Counter defense 556. Five, I'll stop them intercepting it. I'm doing it now. Good boy. 556 five, neutralized. Thank goodness Mickey is an expert hacker. Like Cliffs of Dover? What the hell is that for? Sir, there's a reason! Sorry. <laughs> Shoot him! Tumbles out and survives. Hey, didn't break. Hmm. Oh Lord, we haven't even got a prime minister. Maybe you should have a go. Me? <laughs> I'm only a backbencher. I'd vote for you. Now don't be silly. Look, I better go and see if I can help. Hang on. It, the chain of command has gone down so far. You might be next. Taking all the credit. Should be you on there. My daughter saved the world. I think the doctor out a bit. Alright then. Him too. <laughs> you should be given knighthoods. It's not the way he does things. No fuss, he just moves on. It's not that bad if you gave him a chance. He's good in a crisis, I'll give him that. Uh, That's like most of his point. I want to learn about you and him and that life you lead. I mean, I don't know, he's an alien. For all I know, he eats grass and safety pins <laughs> and things. Hello? Right, I'll be a couple of hours, then we can go. You got a phone? You think I can travel through space and time and haven't got a phone? It's a police box, of course he has a phone. Hours. I've just got to send out this dispersal. There you go. 
That's cancelling out the Slovene's advert in case any bargain hunters turn up. My mother's cooking. Good, put her on a slow eat and let her simmer. She's cooking tea. I could fly the TARDIS right into the heart of it, then ride the shockwave all the way out. Purple right across the sky and end up anywhere. Your choice. Now, why don't we get to see episodes like that? How can they, how can they do that? They saw it. They're just not ready. You're happy to believe in something that's invisible, but if it's staring you in the face, nope, can't see it. There's a scientific Did the back of that, that say something about thing. wibbly wobbly? <laughs> something. This life of yours, it's just too much. I, I couldn't do it. Don't tell her I said that. All right, well, in the future, he did offer. Jim comes around again. You forget him. It's a time machine. I could go traveling around suns and planets and all the way out to the edge of the universe. By the time I get back, yeah? Ten seconds would have passed. Just ten seconds. Assuming he doesn't screw it up again. Stop worrying. Ten seconds. Because I swear, oh. something on the back of the newspaper before yeah. he turned around with the alien hoax. Let me see. Said, so, yeah. Let me see. Don't get the wibbly wobblies. Yeah. I swear it said, don't get the wibbly wobblies. Yeah, something like that. Alrighty. <laughs> now, despite all the humor that they set up in the first episode, there was much less humor in this one. Although the alien exploding all over the. Uh, the apartment kitchen <laughs> was very funny. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they necessarily, I guess, because of the threat, the existential threat to the world, needed to take it to a more serious uh, level. But uh, other than that, again, I think it's a it's a good story. It, it all holds together. Yeah. They're you know they're essentially junkyard people. You know they're going to reduce the earth to slag, and then of course it would all be radioactive, and then they sell the radioactive to all the <laughs> cut rate space pirates out there. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it does seem like... It definitely feels like something that they would have, like, brought up at one point or another in classic Doctor Who. Because, like, they they tended to do that more, like, in... Uh, genuinely, in space. Where it's, you know, you have the more capitalistic side of it. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is where we normally see the sort of, you know, the side of it, like, well, even in the future, in space... Nothing's really changed. You know, there's still capitalism. There's still, well, we got to make it here so we can get my bonus. Cybermen be damned and everything like that. But normally we see that in terms of humans. I like that this is taking more of the alien side of that. It's like, yeah, yeah aliens are pretty much exactly the same, you know? And the Slitheen are like that where they're just, they just want to, yeah, sell the, sell the Earth for scrap, get their money, then they'll probably just move on to a different planet. Yeah. So... <laughs> so, um, I guess the whole setup, again, is they are trying to not make it so incredibly serious. Um, again, um, Seventh Doctor McCoy and Fifth Doctor Tom Baker had a lot more humor than, than a lot of the others. Uh, even Trump, uh, in some aspect. So I, I see what they're trying to do. Trying to th <coughs> throw in a little bit more humor to it, and yet keep it, you know, this incredible action adventure science fiction thing that they started out with. Um, I think it works. Uh, like you said, the the fact that they have now CGI, although this is you know twenty years ago CGI compared to nowadays, it would, yeah, it it. it hardly works like that but uh, again overall uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the entire people say don't call it a reboot uh, the continuation whatever yeah, you want to whatever you want to call it the revival yes yeah um, I, I think it works well and again I'm uh, very pleased with his interpretation because he's got that kind of menace that all of the doctors you know, Hartnell had it 
Tom Baker really had it, uh, had, of course, Colin Baker had it uh, in, in spades, as it were. Uh, so, But he can also be very lighthearted and you know, jovial and joke about it and everything. So, uh, yeah. I, again, overall, the mixture, uh, I, I really am enjoying it. Yeah, and one thing, especially with modern Doctor Who, is they'll sort of play up more of the drama and... And I mean, like, they'll play up a lot of the, the comedic aspects, but they'll really also show, like, all right, here's a moment where it's like, all right, the Doctor is not happy, and everyone around him is going to suffer because of it. <laughs> and and Eccleston does play that very well. And But I like that there is sort of that back and forth. Like, he, he kind of switches on a dime where it's like, you know, he'll he'll be confronting the Slitheen about, you know, about their plans, and it's like, well, you know, they're just going to destroy the Earth, you know, destroy the entire human race, then they're going to divide up the Earth up into chunks, sell it, you know, to any pirate who can pay, but then he'll switch to, uh, m more from anger, more to just a serious, you know, kind of like, well, we don't, I don't know, like, he can't even answer Jackie's question, you know, no. can he keep Rose safe and stuff, but then... He'll turn on another dime, and then he'll, you know, be f trying to figure out, you know, what are they? What's their actual species? Until he finally ran uh, lands on, if I can say it all correctly, Raxacorcophallopatorius. <laughs> so, and you know, he's and he's got this bright smile on his face as he's trying to figure it out. So it's like, so Eccleston does like, within an instant, he switches between. Yeah. Uh, all these different moods, and each one feels right for the Doctor to have. So, now um, this uh, this uh, this question of you know can he keep Rose safe? If you go back and think about it, you know through the first seven Doctors, isn't Adric the only one that they ever lost? Didn't everyone else either stay at a specific place? Like Susan decided to stay. With the young man there in twenty one fifty, yeah, something. Like uh, Ian and Barbara were sent back home. Yeah, Ben and Polly were sent back home. Uh, Jamie was sent home. It, all, it seems like all of them ended up somewhere, but Adric is the only one that they ever lost. Um, yeah, and it, you know because we don't we don't count. Katarina. Katarina, or uh, I think in the Daleks master plan there was also the uh, the the one uh, person that kind of came along for a little bit and then yeah. it kind of died at the end and the Doctor was able to survive. So, like, th there was the occasional like that, but yeah, I think I think you're right. I think Adric might be the only one where it's just, he was just lost, yeah. you know? Um... And that, that could be something that still kind of weighs on the Doctor's mind. It's like, well, you know, e even if everyone else, you know, found a place and lived happily, he cannot say that that will always happen because Adric was the one that died. And you could also think about, like, well, even if a lot of the others were fine, how many of them were brought back exactly to where they left? Yeah. You know, because that's where... Jackie's concern is is that you know Rose is gonna go off. She's gonna even if she doesn't die, she might just be trapped on some moon or something. Yeah. And Rose is saying, "Well, it's a time and space machine. I'll just come back, you know, ten seconds later." And it's like, "Well, first off, that's already been proven to not work properly. You were supposed to be back after twelve hours. It was twelve months. But then you have to think about like, yeah, you know, uh, Ian and Barbara. I think you know they." I think technically they came back two years after they had left, so it's like that wasn't too much, too bad of a difference. Um, but then, you know, you'll get uh, you'll get some companions, even like Romana, who wanted to. To be fair, she wanted to go and leave Gallifrey and all that, and she was able to do that. But she was left in quite literally a different dimension, the crossing into a different dimension <laughs> yeah. with weird lion people and canine you know so it's like or um or like nissa i i, can't, I don't even remember what happened nissa nissa stayed behind to help the people stop the plague right yeah no uh steven yeah got in an argument with the doctor didn't want to stay with him anymore but then ended up getting the job of helping the, the civilization yeah. get back on track other than adric tegan 
was the only one I can think of who said, I can't take this anymore. There's, yeah. There's just too much awfulness. And then he sent her back to Earth, but... Well, with Tegan, she was... It, it happened that that was on Earth after... Did they defeat... I think it was the Cybermen? Or no, it was the Daleks. They defeated the Daleks, and then Tegan was like, you know what? I'm on Earth. I'm in my own time. And I've seen too much, yeah. and I'm gonna. So it's like, so that works out. But like, yeah, with Nissa, where it's like, you know, Nissa was on Trocken with her father. She didn't go back to Trocken. Her father's dead, pretty much, or just you know assimilated by the master. So it's like, e- even that, it's like, even if Rose might be okay, who knows where her circumstances yeah. will end up by yeah. the end of this. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I know, but and they know, but you don't know. I don't. And that's know. and and the people watching this for the first time wouldn't have known. Yeah. So, so that is uh, that is a concern, and I like that with this season uh, and just with this especially, it's like let's really talk about the human element. Like you know, you could get away with this. I feel like in the '60s, where it's like you know. Steven, and to be fair, we didn't even know where Steven was from. He was yeah. just trapped on some planet that the Daleks had. But it's like, well, here's Steven. We picked him up from somewhere. Now we're just going to leave him somewhere else or or something like that. Um, but like this one, it's like, here's the human element, the human consequences of a girl going with a 900-year-old alien in a box through time and space. And how does that affect the people around her which it's not that many people around her it's just two it's just jackie and mickey but that's still a heavy burden on the two of them yeah so <sighs> um and i like the little easter egg there you know if that wasn't if it, uh, my eyes weren't deceiving me the you know don't get the wibbly wobblies and then i mentioned last time around there have been two mentions of was it big wolf or bad wolf or bad something wolf that, all right so obviously the showrunners are dropping easter eggs and so that what that means is somewhere along the line now there's 13 episodes in this first season did you say yes somewhere along the line somebody sat down and said here's kind of a plan for what we're going to do not like the first three or four doctors where it was like literally from week to week everybody went really that happened last yeah. week we didn't know about that so we're going to write something completely different yeah pretty much like you and know for something completely different with classic doctor who it was it, it really was just like a well you know bill wrote the last episode there's a little bit of something maybe you could reference in the first five minutes aboard the tardis and then you can just go into the episode you wrote you know or they would go in and just be like all right just add this little bit here that talks about like oh well you know tegan is still mad about something that happened last episode all right we put that in and now we move on to to the actual story it's like the the continuing plot that's going through here um is something very different for uh for doctor who um now again i know you've you've seen all of the new who uh until is it matt smith mentions the timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff does that ever come back um, Am I seeing things here? I think you are seeing things here. I don't remember if... This is a problem. We watch all of classic Doctor Who and I don't remember it. <laughs> but I don't remember if any of the classic Doctors said it specifically or if it was just something, maybe something in a book or something. But the first time it's really mentioned in modern Doctor Who uh, is in a David Tennant episode. And that's kind of where it caught on. I think it caught on in in the fandom uh i think i I could just be saying that or at least that's that's the first time that i notice it as far as it being on the back of that newspaper i think that is just a uh coincidence i don't think like that's it that's not really leading anywhere so um so yeah i did like the little moment where uh where the doctor it's when they first get into the cabinet room and the doctor pulls the uh, the secretary's body into uh into the cabinet or closet or whatever and he says you know do you know his name and harriet just says no i you know i spoke to him i brought him coffee but i never asked his name 
and he just says sorry and it's it's just a tiny little moment but i i, I like that that it's like you know obviously the doctor cares about the human cost uh the or the human losses uh in any situation that he's in yeah. but i just like that that little moment there yeah. like we didn't even really ask his name so um but as for the other stuff i mean i guess that could lead us into harriet jones future prime minister um which is an interesting uh an interesting idea because now that i think back on it it's like that's a weird thing to to be like yes you know here's a future prime minister and it's like maybe they didn't expect the show to go this long but it's like i, I don't know because now you have to fit that in to the actual prime ministers that existed but i'm i mean the prime minister they already had that died was already a fictional prime minister yeah. so um All so it, timelines yeah it, it just kind of works out um uh although i feel like uh the people of the united kingdom would love having harriet jones as opposed to some of their previous prime ministers yeah. so um but and and i like that at the end that it's like you know yeah it's, it's ridiculous that the mp for flydale north <laughs> is kind of in charge now but like and that moment where she does take take charge it's like you know it's not your decision to make i'm the only person here elected by the people you know, for the people to represent their interests so i have to make the decisions like yeah it kind of is because all all the slid the slithine done have done is kill all those people and then just bring in you know was one of them was like the the head of a boating club or something yeah. and the reporter's just like we're not sure why they're here but they're here yeah. <laughs> i'm just reporting the facts <laughs> now uh, of course the united states uh and i think it was uh, with the passage of the 25th amendment which set the actual rules for what happens when a president uh either dies in office or can no longer function and that was brought in after uh, john f kennedy was assassinated but there's also now a chain of command after the president and the vice president the next person in line is the Speaker of the House. Um, after that, I think it's President Pro Tempore of the Senate. And then there's a list of cabinets like Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and so forth. Go the way. It's like the last one is like either Secretary of Agriculture or Secretary of Transportation or something way down the line. Yeah. But when there's a State of the Union address and everybody is supposed to attend, they always have the what they call the designated survivor, somebody who does not attend so that if there's a terrorist attack of some kind and it kills, it basically decapitates the American government, then there is at least one person that is left who will then assume command. And in fact, there was a TV show, I think, called Designated Survivor, and that actually took place. But given that history, we've also, in the past, had people who literally came out of nowhere. All right, 18, this would have been in the 1840s, young man from Illinois, got elected to Congress. He actually stood up on the uh, floor of the House of Representatives and spoke out against the Mexican-American War. And the people back home in Illinois said, this young man doesn't know squat, so let's not reelect him. 10 years later, literally, he runs for Senate. He runs against the most popular man in the United States, Stephen Douglas, basically gets creamed again. Nobody thinks this guy is going anywhere. In 1859 and 1860, the man says, I'm going to run for president of the United States from this brand new political party called the Republicans. And because this is at the split between the Southern Democrats and the Northern Democrats, this literally unknown person gets elected president of the United States, and it was Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. You know, I, and I'm curious, it is the, the chain of commit. We've never gone like too far into like a situation where we had to start you know, like, well, let's start going down the list. It's only ever been, well, unfortunately, the president has died, thus the vice president yeah. assumes command. Um, now, that was, the chain of command was created after the Kennedy assassination? The formal chain of command, okay. yes. Because before that, it was still, if the president dies, the vice president yes. just assumes command yes. and becomes the president. Uh, and... There was a secondary kind of crisis in 1973 or 4 when Nixon resigned. The problem was his vice president had already resigned previous to that. And so there was a 
space where literally nobody was the vice president, which meant that if something had happened to Nixon before he nominated Gerald Ford to become his new vice president and was uh, confirmed by Congress, the Speaker of the House, strangely enough, a guy from Oklahoma, became the next in line for the presidency. Hmm. So he was, uh, what was his name? Um, they, they called him the Little Giant. Um, he was from Muskogee. I'll think of his name at some point. Anyway, but yeah, he was essentially the acting vice president, even though he was never confirmed by Congress, until Gerald Ford was nominated and Congress confirmed him, and then Nixon resigned. Gerald Ford became the only man to ever become president of the United States without getting a single vote from the people of the United States. He was elected only by the people of his district back in Michigan. Hmm. Interesting. So, I... I would be curious, like, if it's, like, I guess what the structure is in the UK. I mean, granted, I mean, they churn through through prime ministers all the time. I assume if the prime minister dies in a week, you know, they all vote, so. Well, that's the whole parliamentary system. Yeah. Uh, you never actually elect a prime minister. What you do is you elect the party, and then, for example, this uh, past week or so, the Labour Party came out of nowhere for the first time in 14 years, wiped out the, the Conservative Party, and then the Labor Party got together and said, we nominate, uh, I think his name is Starmer, uh, and because he was elected by the Labor Party, he becomes the new Prime Minister. Hmm. So it's an interesting thing that they do, and in some ways it's much better than what we do, because we get a lot of very unqualified people running for president. And that's, I have said probably since Nixon, that I think, even though the Constitution only has two qualifications for president, one is you must have been born in the United States and lived here for at least 14 years, and second, you have to be at least 35 years of age. I think there should be a, a second part of, or a third part of that qualification, is that you have to have had previous government experience. Because several times in the last, especially 30, 40 years, businessmen you know, Ross Perot, uh, Rudy uh, Giuliani, although Giuliani was in politics, he was mayor of New York, uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, Donald Trump, all these people who say, uh, I think because I know how to run a business, I know how to run the government. Government is a completely different thing than a corporation or, or any other kind of business. Because as the, as the boss, as the CEO or whatever your title is, you're in charge. The president is not in charge. Yeah. Right? The president is one of three branches of our government that have checks and balances. The people's representatives in the House of Representatives and somewhat in the Senate are literally the government of the United States, which is why it's so dysfunctional right now, because the people keep electing a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But they do. So that's the thing, is that like comparing and contrasting, like we see like... Well, you know, you elect the party, and then you know, and then the party decides, you know, oh, well, this guy is going to be the prime minister, and it's like, I can't really like talk or criticize because like I genuinely would not be able to think of like which which system is better, what the UK has or what the US has. Honestly, I it probably goes either way. Like I'm sure there are pros and cons to both of them. So now, I'm not sure about the British system. I th I think because this is from what I understand about it, I think that a prime minister, unless there's some kind of emergency, should be given a term, once they're elected, cannot lose the confidence uh, of their party or, or you know, lose the confidence of parliament, uh, say within a year or two years. You know, give them, I mean, yes, even though they fumble, stumble right out of the gate, give them a, a specified length of time to essentially get their act together, and if they can't do it, then call a new election. Because you don't want to see you know, two or three or four elections within the same year. That's what's happened down in Israel, if I recall correctly, that they've had four or five elections in the last, like, two or three years simply because the people want Netanyahu and then they don't want him and then they do want him and then they don't want him. So, I, I don't know. It's just there needs to be some kind of structure. And again, uh, if I'm misrepresenting the British Parliament, please forgive me. Again, it's been years since I taught world history. Uh, but, yeah, there needs to be, say, all right, you get... 18 months to 24 months to to get your act together, and if you can't do that, then we can call for new elections. Yeah, so 
and it it is one of the things in America. It is it is a it's either a harsh four years or it's a slightly less harsh eight years, and then that's it. Yeah, and you don't get anything else. Yeah, and FDR made sure of that. <laughs> Well, there ha- and again, we're discussing politics here at the end just to kind of fill time, I guess. Yeah. There has been, uh, and I don't know how much popularity it has, but uh, part of the problem with the United States presidency is people say that as soon as you're elected in your first term, you have to start campaigning to get a second term yeah. because it's only four years. Uh, and some people have said we should do the presidents like we do the senators. You can serve six years, but you can only serve one term. And that way, you have six years to prove yourself. And during that time, there'll be no such thing as campaigning for a second term because you've, got, you, you've essentially got six years to prove to the United States, this is what I can do. And if you can't do it, then the next time somebody else will take your place. So, Alternatively, if you just want to be really harsh about that, you could just say, you only get one term and it is four years. Yeah. And you just have to deal with that. Maybe make it five years. Five is a nice round number, <laughs> which is weird because it's an odd number, but we all we all understand how that works. But five years, you know, yeah, it's half a decade. It kind of works as a bit of compromise. I don't know. Anyway. So. Anywho. Anywho. Um, Up next? Or is uh, we covered everything? That's kind of everything. <laughs> um, the only thing, I mean, we briefly mentioned it, but just the... Uh, using the vinegar to blow them to smithereens. So, like, th- that was an interesting way of doing it. Um, now, uh, kind of a loose thread here. They blew up 10 Downing Street to kill all the Slitheens there. What Were there Slitheens on the ship that was under the North Sea, or was that just an automated? Because uh, they did gather everybody together. Yeah. So maybe it was just an auto- automated signal and no longer... A threat because yeah. the doctor at the end did say I'm canceling the advertisement yeah I, it was probably an automated thing and what they were going to do is they all wanted to be there when they got the call then they get the codes quickly run down to the Thames get in their spaceship launch all the nukes everything blows up okay, yeah. and then they're okay. they're safe in their spaceship yeah. yeah so so that was the thing but they all wanted to be there and out of their skin in uh, in the prime minister's office. So, um, so yeah, and and I do like <laughs> like I never really thought about it. I, I guess just because you know I was I was so early in in this show and I didn't know much else. But having watched all all of Doctor Who, it is kind of funny that like all right. So how do we you know what clever way are we gonna do to get out of this? We're gonna launch a missile at Downing Street and just murder them in <laughs> not cold blood. I mean, you're, yeah. you're trying to save the earth, but it's like we're just we're just gonna kill them. Yeah. That's just it. There's no other clever way around it. We are just going to kill them, and I, I, I kind of like that, you know. So, now, again, I may be misremembering this, but I was thinking that one of the companions left because. The doctor was it Tom Baker that they they had to essentially do the same sort of thing. They had to pull the plug on some alien problem, and one of the people said, "No, I can't do this. I can't." I may be misremembering it. So anyway, move on. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't fully remember because because for Tom Baker, it it might have been it might have been Tegan. I I don't know because like. Because Sarah Jane, you just had to leave behind. If it was Leela, Leela would have been the one suggesting to kill them anyway. So, um, and then Romana, he just left behind. Yeah. Uh, to She went off to go do her thing. So, yeah, I don't remember. Um, so it's great that we're watching this with all the context of classic Doctor Who and none of the memory of it. So, <laughs> um, That's a great slogan for us. All the context, none of the memories. Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's pretty much it. That's and all I got. Next up, again, what I the only other uh, Eccleston episode that I have seen, and again, out of all the Doctor Who that we've seen all the way from 63 now up to 2005 and 6, this is one of the top five. I think Dalek is, an, is a brilliantly written piece of work. Yeah, so we will be re-watching that next week. And we watched that like before we even started going through 
just classic who normally like that was oh excuse me i'm a little gassy now oh no <laughs> better check and see if there's a zipper on my head um but yeah we did that one pretty early on actually yeah, yeah. so but yeah that'll be a fun rewatch and we will do that next time but that is basically it with all of that being said we're alex and dad from seventh hour films and we will see you guys next time take care all right, guys, thanks for watching this video. There's a bunch of links on screen if you want to go collect around any of those. There's a playlist with all of our modern Doctor Who reactions, as well as another playlist for all of our classic Doctor Who reactions, if you want to go check those out. There's also a subscribe button and a Patreon button on screen, as well as other links in the description if you want to go check out any of those. See you guys later.